Jenny. Hello. Hello. Back here we, again. Here we are again indeed. Um, quick rundown this week. Our deep dive <laughs> is going to be on Sam Mendes 1917. In and around that though, we'll have the usuals. Six quiz questions from me dotted throughout to keep you listening to the end. Answers at the end only. Uh, we'll be looking at what we'll be talking about what we've watched this week and we'll be having a little look forward to what's coming out or things we found on TV, Netflix or DVD that we think you might be interested in at some point over the next days and weeks. Before we get going, I reckon the first two, first two quiz questions, what do you think? Sounds like a good idea to me. Right. Well, well I know if them. If it's that, well, uh, yeah, yeah, no, probably not. Great. We'll, we'll find out now. Yeah. Okay, question one. Can you name the first film in which James Bond uttered his iconic Bond, James Bond? So I want the first film in which James Bond uttered his iconic, the name's Bond, James Bond. And question two. In Friends, what is Rachel wearing the first time we meet her? So yes, I think you will answer that one comfortably. What do you think? I'm a little bit of a Friends fan. Just you a are a little teeny bit. teeny little bit. Okay, so repeat the question. And friends, what is Rachel wearing the very first time that we meet her? Okay, so there are your two questions. Okay, right, before we, um, before we move on, just a little sip of me Jack Daniels. Thank you very much. Hmm, it is. Let's not tell them it's 10 a.m., eh? Shall we not tell them that? Okay. I think the mic might have picked it up. Oh, right. Don't worry about it. It's not 10am. <coughs> okay, um, what have you watched this week? Jen. I'll be honest hey. with you. Hello. Hi. I'll be honest with you. I haven't watched a lot more this week because I'm still watching Life on Mars. How's that going for you? I'm loving it. It's it's really good. I'm enjoying watching the character of Sam Tyler just torn between the calling that's clearly from his old life, but also he's now integrated himself more into the police force, he's getting involved. Can you just give a bit of background uh, uh, for those who haven't actually watched Life on Mars? What, what, what's the premise? Sure, if you've never seen Life on Mars, it is a show about a police detective who's living in the present day, which at the time was 2006, and he has an accident and wakes up in 1973. Right, okay. A great year. In total confusion. Yes, he has no idea how he got there, and he has... Um, he has no way of getting back home, but he has clues throughout his everyday life that he's tell him that... He's a detective in both worlds. Yes, but... yes. He wakes up as a detective and he has to now make his way in this new police force where they obviously do things very differently. But he gets he gets certain signs and signals that tell him that he can return to his old life. It's, it's implied that maybe he's in a comatose state and people are talking to him and he hears snippets of it. So... I'm, I'm enjoying it. He's no closer to getting home, but there's a lot of great character development. Anything else? Or are you immersed in 1970? No, I've, I've just watched Life on Mars, so I think I'll better, I better hand it over to you because I know you've been watching some stuff. Well, I'm sticking with DCI Banks and um, Van der Volk from last week, uh, and I've discovered another ITV detective, no, not detective, mystery series, a short series, four episodes, I think, called Innocent starring Lee Ingleby and I'm only halfway through the first episode and I really like it so I will have watched it by this time next week. Lee Ingleby who's brilliant in a, a series called The Five from 2016. I believe Innocent is from 2018 so I've been watching that which is good. Uh, what else have I watched? What else did I want to say? You've also finished Tiger King now haven't you? Oh yes Tiger King yes. Wow. Right, come um, on, give me your thoughts on that, because I watched well, it a while ago. Well, my, my 14-year-old daughter um, has been talking about wanting to live in America. After having watched Tiger King, I'm imploring her to reconsider, <laughs> or at least reconsider going to Oklahoma. It's a little bit worrying. They are all crazy. I mean, am I allowed to swear on this? I mean, we uh, haven't so far, but you, oh, might, you might have okay, to. Okay, I won't, but they're, they're bat bleep. <laughs> crazy you can fill in the gaps yourselves uh, but thoroughly enjoyable um, series on uh, uh, Netflix Tiger King Joe Exotic wow um, what a guy watch it if you haven't I just say that's all I say your 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 mouth will be open throughout it is 
Yeah. Are they really like that? Are they? Yeah. Are they really? And who do possible? you who do you side with? Because they are all equally mad. Um, yeah, you're torn. You can't. Who's the least bad? The least repulsive? The least offensive? The least evil? The least crazy? I don't know. I don't <laughs> no, have an I answer. Do. It's a different answer to every one of those questions. I think. Um, yeah, Tiger King. What else have I watched? What else did we watch? Uh, we started watching we the started Matrix. Watching the Matrix. The Matrix. Uh, saw that originally first time round. Haven't seen it since. Um, there was stuff in there that we'd forgotten existed. Oh well, I forget quite a lot of things, but watching it a second time with such a gap, and uh, we've watched about 35, 40 minutes of it. Yeah. It is superb. I love it. Um, so yeah, get on the Matrix if you haven't already. Okay, uh, I reckon two more questions. Let's go with two more questions. Are we in for two more questions? Yeah. Right, question three. Grey's Anatomy is set in which US city? Don't answer. Just, she was just I about to that answer one. that one. Grey's Anatomy is set in which US city? And question four. What is the second rule of Fight Club? Now, we all know the first rule of Fight Club. But how many of you know the second rule of Fight Club? Okay, remember, answers at the end. Uh, I think it's... Time for another sip of Jack Daniels. God, Jack Daniels and Coke is nice, isn't it? Um, anyway, moving on. Um, before you think I'm an, a raving alcoholic, I'm not. Uh, this week's deep dive... <laughs> always makes me it laugh. It gets worse every time. ...is 1917. Right, not 1917 then. Why have you selected 1917? Because, as I said last week, it's a fantastic film which wowed me in cinemas and it has wowed me again now that I've got it on DVD. Main attraction to it being that it is shot in what looks like one continuous take. And I love a film that does something different with editing. So that is why I've chosen it. Okay, right. And we'll get on to that. We'll explore that in a lot more depth in a minute. Um, First off, for, for those of you who have um, been living under a rock for the last 12 months, uh, could you just help, help the listeners out with the kind of basis of the storyline? What's the premise? The film is a war film and it focuses on two soldiers who are tasked to deliver a message to call off an attack that the British army are planning to make on the German army, but little do they know the German army have actually retreated and want the British Army to attack because they are more prepared than they believe. So it's a setup. Yeah, complete setup, and there are no telephone lines. They've all been cut. So these one soldier is initially chosen, and he picks his friend to accompany him. And why is that soldier initially chosen? Because his brother is actually involved in the one attack. Of, one of those soldiers that will be going over into yeah. kind of kind of the. Um, um, definite death or whatever. Yes, so, yeah. and if they succeed in this task, they're going to save about 1,600 soldiers, so it's a lot to take on. And just to kind of um, reverse a little bit, Sam Mendes directed it. Yeah. Um, what's the little kind of contextual background to why he produced this film, why he directed this film? This film is actually based on stories that his grandfather, who fought in the war, told him about having to deliver a message so the film has come from that story and Sam Mendes is, as a child that's one of the stories he remembers and his, his grandfather was what's called a messenger I think yes and the people soldiers that would deliver messages between different what do you call them groups yes companies companies is that I'm, I'm not a huge, not sure I'm not a hu huge on my war um, <laughs> um, vernacular um, right so, Sam Mendes, big director. Uh, what else do we know him from? Jarhead. Another war film. Have not seen it, no. but yes. Um, Skyfall. Skyfall, right, okay. A Bond film, didn't know he'd, he'd done a Bond film. Yeah, he also did Spectre. Two Bond films, Two right, Bond okay. Films. But best known, probably, for American Beauty. Ah, classic. We'll have to do a deep dive into American Beauty as well. I think at, we will. At some point. Okay, so, that's, um, so he's done a couple of war films... Um, Bond, you see that's quite, kind of, you can see similarity crossover there, but American Beauty, yeah, that's very different, that's, that's good, okay, um, right, that's the director, okay, cast, who, cast. who, um, who is the star of the show, star of the film? So, the two lads that you're following, 
um, played by George McKay and Dean Charles Chapman. Never heard of them. No, George McKay has been in a few films before, none of which I'd seen. Uh, Private Peaceful was one of them when he was obviously quite a lot younger. I think that was 2012. Um, Dean Charles Chapman was actually in Game of Thrones for a few seasons, but you did not watch Game of Thrones, no. so you would not know who he was. I have to say the two of them are just utterly brilliant in 1917. I, they're just... Oh, their performance is, is, is just brilliant. The feat they had to undertake, yeah, I think truly incredible. And I like the fact that they are not really well known. Like, even though I vaguely recognised um, Chapman from Game of Thrones, I loved the fact that it was two unknown actors and they were given pretty much most of the screen time. It was great. And, and close-up as well. So their yes. facial expressions are f front and centre and they, they seem very kind of relaxed and natural and uh, reactionary to what they're experiencing. Ironically enough, that they're not well known. I'd never heard of them or seen either of them before. But there are lots of uh, cameos from very famous actors in it yes there? imagine being in a film and having benedict cumberbatch richard madden um, colin firth and they're not the main attraction so you recognize them and i don't think any of those actors is on screen for more than five minutes mm. and they don't take away the light from the boys they add to it and you have that moment of recognizing them but because you're only with them for a few minutes you don't warm to them the same way you warm to the two boys do you think it was necessary to have big names there I really don't think it was because there were other interactions that happened with actors who I didn't recognise and just because it was Benedict Cumberbatch on screen it didn't change the way I felt towards him as a character, it didn't make me think, oh I hope there's more Benedict Cumberbatch in it, I just wanted to follow the two boys. Which, right, so, so which would lead me to think that if I was to have one like kind of critique of it or mild criticism is that there wasn't any need to have those big named actors there because the danger was, although it didn't, but the danger potentially could have been, that it would detract from the performance of the two, the two main guys uh, and their story, their, their journey, which was the primary focus. So I'm just curious about... Yeah, I don't know. The only reason I could think for maybe having those actors was because of what Sam Mendes was trying to achieve. And being a successful director already, I wonder if some of those actors thought... I want to be a part of that if this is successful this film that is supposed to be a long take all these effects everything i wonder if they sort of worked their way in because yeah. they knew it would go down in history and it has okay so you, you you've just referenced that long take right yes so that this film is synonymous with famous for its cinematography it's right off you go talk us through that so the film is supposed to look like the camera never cuts away, never leaves the action. It's actually made up of five long takes and as I was watching the film the second time with the DVD, I was thinking there were moments in my mind where I thought, right, the camera could have cut there. There are moments where the screen is obscured, where the camera is plunged into darkness and I thought, right, they, they, could, have, uh, they could have done it then. But the effect of the long take, as you mentioned earlier, is watching the boys on their journey, we see everything that they see, but sometimes the camera shifts and we see them just walking towards the camera. And so we're limited in our view and we don't always see everything as it happens. We might see something after they see it. And I just love that, I thought it was fascinating. I think that works really well in the trench. Yes, um, As the camera following the trench, because you, you did, what, as watching, you do feel almost breathless and you do kind of feel because it is such a narrow focus point for the camera you do somehow feel um like the walls are closing in on you as well as well a slight claustrophobia yes. with that shot and it's a long a long shot i don't know how many minutes it lasts but it's a good five ten minutes of them just go walking through the the trench bumping into people and yeah um yeah so that's good okay um, how many, you said five? I think it's made up of five long takes. Right. How, I wonder why, why, what was the kind of rationale behind it? I think just to, it, it's a war film and with the camera, just following the boys and seeing what they see, I think it shows how hectic the war is. They're always on the move. So the fact that the camera moves with them, we don't get a chance to rest because the boys don't get a chance to rest. They have a mission that they have to complete 
in a certain number of hours, travel a certain number um, of miles to pass on this message. And so that frantic energy is constant. So when they rest, which isn't very often, the audience get a chance to rest. And I think it just, it just helps with the storytelling so much because you think something happens and there's gonna be a moment of pause, but no, they're going again, they're off again. So we have to pace ourselves with them. Yeah, there, there was a couple of um, scenes where time did pass a lot quicker than the actual time in the film. Um, when he was talking to the lady, the woman and the little baby, for example, quite a few hours yes. passed in there, but it was only a few minutes for us watching. And um, but I, I guess they had to do that, otherwise we'd have spent um, fourteen hours in the cinema watching it, which might not have gone down to the well. Um, you know. No, but I yeah I see what you mean. There's there's certain moments where suddenly we feel like we can rest and I think that is done it's done with purpose so that we get to rest but also so the characters aren't always on the move and there's these beautiful moments that build up that emotion that came through with that scene with the woman and the baby yeah real co real contrast with what was going on yeah exactly. juxtaposition another another uh, term from English literature yes um who's responsible for the cinematography that the Roger Deakins and did he win an Oscar for this? He did, and if it hadn't, I'd have been outraged. So yes. I'm really glad. <laughs> no, fair enough. Uh, anything else to say on um, 1917 in terms of the cinematography? No, I I just think you you have to see it to understand how good it really. Did is. it lose anything from the big screen to the small screen? Honestly, no. I loved it just as much. I I I agree with that. I think. Okay, um, you liked it, clearly. Um, what are the kind of two... If, if I was to ask you to give two reasons for someone to go and watch it or to rent it on DVD, what, 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 what are the two main primary reasons you would encourage someone to watch it for? First reason for me would obviously be the cinematography. Yeah. Go to that saying. I don't need to say any more on that now. But secondly, I think even the story itself because it is just about two boys delivering a message but there's so much that happens on that journey they actually build a really really beautiful narrative around this message um, being delivered and when you say boys they're like about 19 20 yeah okay yes yeah. so they're, they're young um and the story that's built up around them the friendship that you can see developing as they go on this journey and just the people they encounter the different personalities they meet, it does show a completely completely contrasting sides of war, the camaraderie of the men coming together to help each other, but also the brutality, the fact that they're there to do something, they're there to fight, and some people can't get past that. You mentioned the brutality. There are some pretty shocking scenes in it um, involving kind of uh, corpses and um, body parts and decaying corpses as well. Um, yeah, you are constantly reminded of the horrors of war. It is war, yes. Um, and it is very breathless and it's very tense. There are some real um, climactic moments within it as well, uh, as well as that kind of beautiful narrative that you've just described. Uh, have you given two reasons? Two, yes. But okay, yeah. right. Anything negative to say about the film? Anything that um, didn't sit right with you, perhaps? We've already talked about the cinematography and the fact that when the characters rest, the audience get a rest, and I appreciate that. There were a couple of moments, though, where I thought this maybe just isn't realistic because of the urgency of delivering the message. There's a moment towards the end of the film, and um, they're both being close to delivering this message, and then there's this moment of pause, and it lasts quite a long time, and I think initially in the cinema, all I could think in my head was, get up, carry on, let's go. Watching it a second time, I'm, I maybe have other, I think about now, there might be other reasons why that pause was needed. Well, I'll offer a suggestion as to why this... I think, I think that they thought that it was too late. Yeah, you, you said that at the time, and so now... And that and it could, because as soon as the realisation dawned that it wasn't too late, it picked up again. It picks up. It picks up again. Yeah. yeah, but I think it took it took a second viewing to yes. realise that for yes. sure. And that moment is still is still. I think it's one of my favourite scenes in the film. That moment, but 
at the time I just thought the urgency has been lost. Right. So your bad, your negative point isn't really a negative point. Okay, so I'm pretty confident you'd recommend it to somebody else. Um, and we, we do a rating out of five. You gave Vertigo 4.5 out of five last week. How, what are we giving um, to 1917? Okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to 4.6. And yeah. yeah, like I said, not a massive fan of war films, but the cinematography just gives it that little bit of an edge. I think that's fair enough. I can, I can, I can get on board with a 4.6 out of five. For sure. Right, I think we're done. Anything else to say on 1917 and the deep dive? I keep saying deep dive because it just makes me chuckle. <laughs> I'd just say just try and watch the film without getting breathless. That's a challenge. There's a challenge. All right. Definitely watch it. I would recommend it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. Let's uh, crack on. And two more questions. Are we doing two more questions? Yeah, why not? Two yeah. more questions. My last two questions. Question five and question six. So question five is a nice easy one. What country does Paddington Bear come from? Nice change of tone from 1917, change of mood. What country does Paddington Bear come from? And the final question this week, what 2016 film became the first to win an Oscar for Best Picture with an all-black cast? So what 2016 film became the first to win an Oscar for best picture with an all black cast. Okay, so we're going to move on to what's coming up this week, uh, DVD, Netflix TV, etc. And I'll give you the answers to the six questions, the other side of that. Okay. Right then, Jenny, what's coming up? What should I be watching this week or looking out for this week? I'll start with DVDs. There are a few DVDs coming out on the 1st of June, one of which is The Grudge. Now, you're not going to be interested in this because it's horror, but The Grudge, there's a series of films um, called The Grudge. I think it goes up to like The Grudge 3. Well, it turns out they did another one which I didn't know about, uh, and it's basically a, a retelling of the same story, people being haunted by, followed by um, a girl with hair covering her face, very, very creepy. A girl with a grudge, by any chance? I mean, yeah, she seems to. Is I the, guess a lot it, of people, apparently. Is the clue in the name? Yeah, I'll say okay. so. So, for any horror fans, and if you want to relive kind of early 2000s horror, which I would love to do, that is out. The other thing I'd mention is Parasite is also out. It's not officially on my list, but... Uh, Mark Commode has already mentioned that it's uh, coming out, so I trust his judgment. I put in an order on Amazon a little while ago, and it's told me it will be delivered by the end of next week, so I can finally watch Parasite. I'm very excited for yeah, that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, what else? What else? You said one more thing, didn't you? Yes. Um, one thing on Netflix that's coming out is a an American TV series called Space Force. Space Force sounds yes. sounds. Illuminated. It doesn't sound like anything that people would want to watch. Who's in it? Steve Carell is in it. Okay, that, that wins. So the American Office, big, you know, big star. Forty-year-old virgin. Forget about the American Office. Forty-year-old virgin. Okay, yeah. Super. Love him in that. Love that film. Actually, should we do a deep dive into a forty-year-old virgin. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds. That sounds uh, wrong. You yeah. knew what it sounded like. Um, so this is coming out this Friday, so 29th of May. And it is a, I guess, kind of sitcom about a group of uh, American scientists who are going to team up to launch the US military's newest agency, which is the Space Force. This is a, this is a send-up of Trump, isn't it? I've it heard is. about this now. You can see why Steve Carell is on board. I haven't heard too much about it, but I just what, think... on board the actual spacecraft? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I just think with Steve Carell in it, it's bound to be a hit. So I would say watch out for that. And it doesn't really sound like my type of thing at all, but I think the fact that Steve Carell is in it, I will definitely be giving that a go. Excellent. Right. I'm, I'm kind of... My interest is peaked in that now. So we'll see what that looks like when it comes out. Okay. Right. Brilliant. That's, I've got nothing to offer in this section. I've no idea what's coming up uh, in the next week. I just get told what to watch. Or late at night, I do a little search on ITV Hub or BBC iPlayer or Netflix and find mildly interesting things to watch. Right, OK, enough of me rambling. 
quiz question answers. I know that's the only reason you're still here, so let's let's crack on with them. Question one: Can you name the first film in which James Bond uttered his iconic "The name's Bond, James Bond"? Well, it was Sean Connery in 1962, and the film was Doctor No. Well done if you got that. Complete change of tack in Friends. What is Rachel wearing the very first time we meet her? Jenny? A wedding dress. Indeed she is. She's wearing a wedding dress. Why is she wearing a wedding dress? Because she has run away from her wedding. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, okay, question three. Grey's Anatomy is set in which US city do you know? Seattle. It is in Seattle. It's not the best American programme set in Seattle. That is... Fraser. That is indeed, <laughs> yes. Okay, question four. What is the second rule of Fight Club? Well, you know what the first rule of Fight Club? We don't talk about Fight Club. Well, the second rule is a bit of a trick question. It's the same as the first. Do not talk about Fight Club. Question five. What country does Paddington, Be- Paddington Bear come from? Peru. Deepest, darkest Peru, indeed. Um, in fact, there are no bears in Peru, so it's, you know. Clever. Irony. Question six. What... 2016 film became the first to win an Oscar for Best Picture with an all-black cast, and the answer is... Moonlight. Indeed it is. But one last thing before we go. Uh, one good, one bad from your I don't know, small screen viewing for the week. What's your one good? My one good comes from Life on Mars, because that's all I've been viewing. Just be- thinking about Sam Tyler back in the 1970s, seeing celebrities who maybe haven't quite peaked in their fame yet and getting quite excited and not understanding why no one around him is interested in the fact that Mark Bolan is in the same club as them. Ah, oh, and does he go up to him? He does, and he tells him to um, drive carefully, oh. and Mark Bolan seems confused, mm. understandably, should I think. Should have heeded that advice. Yes. Uh, and your one bad? My bad comes from The Matrix, not because necessarily it's a bad thing, but because I've, I haven't seen The Matrix in a long time, and I've just forgot how gory the little bug is at the beginning that they bug him with and it goes in through his belly button. Bless your little cotton socks. You're yeah. delicate. didn't know you were that delicate. You love your horror. Apparently, apparently I am. I just, I think I wasn't expecting it. I didn't go into the Matrix thinking, oh yeah, this is really gory. And then, look. Okay. Go on, um, what about you? Well, I mean, my one good, one bad came from the same programme last week. And I, I think it comes from the same programme this week. Uh, it will come as no surprise that Tiger King, one good, one bad. One good, it is compulsive viewing. One bad is that all crazy and scary and carrying guns, and that terrifies me. Fair I, enough. I think that's it. Did Carol Baskin kill her husband, though? Um, because they all say yes, I'm inclined to say no. It's all just been... I think, up I think he's living on an island somewhere in the Caribbean. Are you surprised he got away from her, though? I think that was part of the that was part of the uh, <laughs> motivation. Yeah. Anyway, we'll find out when the Carol Baskin documentary is made. Oh, I cannot wait for that! <laughs> I'm so excited. I just want to see more clips of Carol Baskin and her husband, current husband's wedding photos. That is how I want my wedding to be. It's harrowing. Is I thought we were going to say. <laughs> anyway. No, that's exactly what I picture my wedding to be like. So um, look out for that in the future. Right. Yeah. Great. Excellent. <laughs> anyway, on that note, it's late. My glass is empty. I need another Jack Daniels. Over and out. Say goodbye, Jenny. Bye.